Thank you, Lord. We want to teach you a very simple song. It's called To Know You More. Is, there's a desire for each and every one of us to know the Lord. The Bible says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst. As long as you have a hunger and thirst for Him, He's obviously going to feed you. Here's the word. Just one passion, one purpose, to know you more and more. When I know you, I'll find me. Say it again. Just one passion, one purpose, to know you. More and more when I know you, I'll find me. Yeah, the chorus. No life outside you. Ah. No one besides you, Jesus. Let me know. One passion, just one passion, one purpose, one purpose. Tell him to know you, to know you more and more. Cause when I know you, God, when I know you, I'll find you. Let it be your prayer today. One passion, tell him, just one passion. Crying up to Jesus, one purpose. I want to know you.
just to be here close to you ha huh. just to be here close to you is my desire i desire you jesus your message just to be just, just to be Let it be your prayer today, God. Just I want to be good. To to One thing that I desire. One thing Just that I be I long for. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes. Yes. Welcome to our service today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Pastor Chichi and I and the leaders of our church really enjoy bringing these services to you. And uh, we hope you enjoy them wherever you're watching it, whether it's in Harare, in Zimbabwe, in Africa, or around the world. Thank you for your support. And to all of you that are here this morning, thank you for coming. God richly bless you. Please take your seats. Okay, let's go to our presentation for today. The title of the message, the series for the next month or so, God Being My Helper, is Seeing a Full House. Seeing a Full House. John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. God has a house and many houses in that house. And he says, I... I'm telling you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then Hebrews 3, verse 3. But this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house, he who built the house, has more honor than the house. So there's the builder. And then there's the house. And then there are individuals that occupy the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses, verse 5, was faithful in all his house. That's God's house as a servant. As a servant. When we're dealing with spiritual dynamics concerning Almighty God, God is everywhere at the same time, full of everything at all times, and He's able to provide all things to all people. 
at all times. In him is no lack. And so when we're dealing with God, for example, in this service, in this service there is all God. There is all knowledge. There is all power. There is all revelation. There is all wealth, provision. It's all here. And there are moments in a service where God will release something for an individual. There might be 200 needs, and they are, but sometimes only one person will get that need met. And there's scripture for that. For example, in chapter number 5 of the book of John, there were many impotent folk there, many. But he went for one man, stepped over everybody, and went for one man who was there for 38 years. In John chapter 9, there were many, many blind people in Israel. He just healed one. In Luke chapter number uh, 23, I think it is, going through Jericho, Bartimaeus took off his garment and went and asked the Lord to heal him. And it's not like Jesus didn't know that Bartimaeus was there, but Bartimaeus had to press in. And so sometimes God's methods are very difficult to understand. And so in a meeting like this, whatever you expect, generally you get. And so this last Sunday, while I was in Atlanta, I, um, I preached Friday night and Saturday day. I was really, really tired. And so I didn't attend the Saturday night service with uh, Pastor Benny Hinn uh, because I was just mentally, physically, emotionally just really, really tired. I hadn't slept for like 40-some hours. And so Sunday morning, I attended the service. I was asked to receive the offering, and so they had a moment to honor Benny Hinn and his wife, and so they did that, and uh, then I was going to receive the offering for the day for the conference, and so Benny Hinn, after he received his gift, he said, oh, by the way, I forgot to receive the offering last night. I'll just go ahead and receive it now, and uh, he shared a few things that I'm going to share with you here directly from his message that uh, reminded me of a number of things I was taught as a young Christian and that I lived by all my life as a believer uh, and as a pastor and a reminder that I must continue. And uh, he was saying, he started all his ministry, he was from Canada and was following uh, Oral Robertson, got to know him very well as the years went by, and then started working with and following the late, great Catherine Kuhlman, who had healing services in Pittsburgh. And uh, anytime you have a chance to go to the U.S. and you go to the city of Pittsburgh, you can go to the building where she used to have church. And I would go there uh, to Pittsburgh almost every year for years to preach for Archbishop Carlington and a couple of other guys. And I'd always ask them to take me by that building. And I, I've picked up a number of stones from there because uh, there's stones actually keep a record of events. And there's a lot of Bible for that. And I would put my hands on the building and try to historically and also through uh, event memory, try to download some of the most extraordinary miracles that took place in the history of the church in that building. And Ben Hinn was saying that Catherine Kuhlman was so focused that during her preaching, th there was nothing that would get off focus. He said uh, one time while she was preaching, the balcony collapsed and there were people that were injured. She never stopped. She just kept on preaching because she would not allow anything to hinder or, or tamper with the anointing. 
And uh, I learned a lot of things as, my, as the years have gone by. I was doing a crusade in West Africa, and uh, they have like a 10-page uh, list of things that you would want and so on and so forth. And generally, I'm a low-maintenance person. And so they, on one of the lists, they even had there, what kind of cologne do you use? Is there any type of cologne or stuff that irritates you and stuff? Well, I said no. But the story behind that was uh, a renowned uh, world evangelist uh, had on a list of colognes that he didn't want armor bearers or security people wearing because it would irritate him. And uh, he said uh, any time he would have that kind of irritation, it would hinder the anointing and his ability to be able to fully minister to individuals. And, of course, this is another level of ministry and function. And I know uh, there are times when I'm going to meetings and I know that God's going to do something special. And there are small things that can raise a level of irritation and that impedes one's ability to release anointing. For example, I arrived at a certain city and I was left waiting outside for somebody to pick me up. They were an hour late. And I was going straight from the airport straight into the meeting. And so I was already up to here with irritation and angry. So how do you switch from that to giving people everything? And uh, so there, there are things that you kind of sort of learn along the way. And so he was sharing uh, his journey. And uh, he met Suzanne, his wife, and was going to propose to her and ask her to marry him, which he did, but was then going to ask her dad for permission. And he said his dad was sitting by the, uh, her dad was sitting by the fireplace, and he asked uh, Benny, he said, uh, I want a record of your giving. And he said, you, he said, a record of my giving? He said, yeah. Because uh, if you're not a giver, you're not marrying my daughter. And if you are an emotional giver, you definitely are not marrying my daughter. And so he went ahead to explain what the old man meant. And he said, an emotional giver is literally somebody who, who has no discipline in their giving. They give a little here, a little there, a lot there, sometimes nothing. And he took me back to when I started my own giving many, many years ago. I started doing a dollar a month. I mean, a dollar a week, every service, one dollar. And I said to the Lord, if you give me a dollar a week for my offering, I will give you a dollar a week. Everyone say, give seed to the sower. And that's not everybody. Everyone say, give seed to the sower. So God gives seed to the sower. So I asked the Lord, give me a dollar a week. And then I went to two dollars a week, five dollars a week for a year, ten dollars a week for a whole year. That's besides my tithing. Twenty dollars a week for a whole year. $50 a week for a whole year. I then went to $100 a week for a whole year. And then another year. And then I increased to $1,000 a week every service. A thousand U.S. dollars every week. And when I'd look back at the end of the year, I'd wonder where the money came from. But it was God giving seed to the sower. And I was reminded last week Sunday, and I was nudged again this morning that I owe God back offering for 2020 because in all the weeks we had no church I hadn't given an offering I was watching at church on Sundays on the screen and stuff like that and I put an offering but it wasn't the amount that was required of me when I was in church and so this week I'm going to go back and calculate all the weeks that I I owe that money, and I'm going to pay it back. Because the Lord spoke to me, says, you should not be in debt at all. And I'm not, teaching. I don't owe any money. And you should not be in, 
great financial needs. And generally, we're not outside of Kingdom Cathedral. We're not. But there's money that we need. And one of the reasons for it is that we owe in back offering and also in tithing. I remember in my tithing journey, I started paying my tithes one year in advance. Those of you that have been with us for a while will remember me announcing that. At crossover service, I would come with my tithing for the year ahead. I'd pay tithing one year in advance. And it was for anticipated earnings. And so now I have to go back this week and, and look at all that I was supposed to do and give. And then the Lord took me to, unfortunately for me, to Leviticus 29 and verse 30. And this is what he said. And all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or whether of the fruit tree, is the Lord's. It is only unto the Lord. And if a man will redeem or borrow that money from the Lord, the tithes, he's allowed to do that. But he has to pay 20% interest. So now I'm shivering because what I owe with 20% interest is going to be huge. And if I don't pay that, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm giving you my testimony. If you don't pay it, if I don't pay it, I'm going to be consumed with the interest only. And so there are a number of things that Cheech and I want to do. There are some things we need to do. Some years ago, a man came and see me. It's probably about 12 years ago. And uh, gave me a piece of land, a plot in the Bahamas, which is beachfront land. And my next door neighbor uh, on the western side, on the left, was Brad Pitt. And so uh, they were doing the paperwork and going to send it over. And in that month, that man passed away without us getting that piece of land. And so I'm saying to the Lord, but why did you send a man to tell me that story with the promise if it's not going to happen? And there's all kinds of reasons for it. And there are all kinds of promises that we have. All kinds of things that there are people intending to do for you that have not come to pass. And what we're going to do now here is begin to tick and cross. Tick boxes, cross things that need to be done. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to become dependable, uh, disciplined givers and not emotional givers. If you are an emotional giver, Benny Hinn said, an emotional giver is cursed. An emotional giver cannot operate in the blessing. Now the Bible does say, we'll get to it in a minute, that given it shall be given unto you, that's 638 of Luke, we'll get to that in a minute. And so a disciplined giver is what we need, a disciplined giver. And so whatever your giving is, let's be consistent. Let's do a year at a time. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. And God will give seed to the sower. Say, God gives seed to me, the sower. Can you say that with a little bit of passion? Job 5.20 In famine, he will redeem you from death. And in war, from the power of the sword. So famine, he'll redeem you from death. In war, from the power of the sword. David can tell us a few stories about both famine and war. Verse 21. You shall be hid from the scourge of the tongue. You know, people's words uh, and, and your words can eternally shape to bless somebody or to hurt somebody. Never curse, always bless. If you can't do either, 
don't say anything. And uh, my life is a testimony of something that happened to me 60, 52 years ago. And I have a behavior of words that were spoken in my life 52 years ago. That those handful of words has affected my behavior even now, even today, even this morning, even just before this service. And so he says, he shall hide you from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shall you be afraid of destruction when it comes. Verse 22, at destruction and famine, you shall laugh. At destruction and famine, you shall laugh. I pray that God would give you that anointing. I pray that God would give you that anointing. That when destruction and famine comes, you laugh. Because you know that the Lord is there with you. Job was a giver, a significant giver, which will be lesson number three or four in chapter number one of Job and also chapter number 42. The things that Job gave to God... And when destruction and famine came to Job, Job laughed in its face. Let's go to Luke 6, verse 38 and break down. There are seven things, features in Luke chapter number 6 and verse 38. This is a universal law. And so any human being, whether they are Hindu, Muslim, Shinto, Christian, a version of Christianity, a non-believer, any human being is covered by this law. There are then laws that are given to believers in a different category and sector, which we might touch today. So in this universal law, he says, give, and number one, it shall be given to you. That's not Jews. That's not Christians. He's addressing everybody. Give, and it shall be given to you. The way it's going to be given to you is good measure. Whatever you give, love, hate, food, water, clothing, fuel, it's coming back to you. Good measure. Everyone say good measure. Say good measure. And so the reason we're asking you to be a disciplined giver is you are establishing a measure. Because if you're giving a hundred today, a dollar next week, nothing the following week, what measure is going to be measured to you? There has to be a measure. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give unto your bosom. Right now in the city, Somewhere in Zambia, South Africa, Mozambique, Botswana, Kenya, the United States, somebody is looking for you to give you something. Good measure. Everyone say good measure. Say good measure. Say some person is looking for me. Say that again. Somebody is looking for you to give you something. In my lifetime, I've been given so many things. I've been given vehicles. I was in the UK in 1990. And I walked into the service teaching. I had no vehicle. I was a non-entity. Nobody knew me, really. And the superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church had heard of me because of my role I played with the United Pentecostal Church in Zimbabwe and with the struggle Zimbabwe was in administratively and so they saw me at the world conference they'd remembered me from the world conference five years before because Chicha and I took a group we had taken 52 people on tour and converted but most of them were singers anyway so we had this huge choir we went from Harare, Amsterdam uh, flew via Vienna uh, Bangkok and we spent about eight or nine days in Manila, the Philippines. And then from the Philippines, we went to the United States. And uh, so the superintendent, James Dallas, had heard of me and remembered that event. So when I got to the World Conference in Amsterdam, uh, 
He said, oh, it's good to see you. Uh, I believe you're taking a group to London. I said, yeah, I got a small group. And he said, are you preaching for anybody? I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, can you preach for us at Life Tabernacle in Battersea Park? I said, sure. And so I was staying with one of our members who was over our children's ministry. His name's Temba Gwebu. And Temba was staying in, in Kilburn. And so I went to the service. It was a 12 o'clock service. Uh, that was their morning service. And uh, it was just a, a kind of like a low season. And so I really had nothing much to say. I preached from Genesis 24 concerning Rebecca. And in the middle of that message, the Holy Ghost fell and the power of God hit. I got a fright. You know, they got a bit of a fright because they were very low-key kind of a church because James Dallas was a very quiet, reserved person. And so after that move of God, he said to me, what are you doing tonight? Can you preach for our night service? I said, sure. And the power of God fell again. And so for the next 21 days, I was preaching there almost every night somewhere. And so there was a couple there uh, in the service. It was the Sunday after that. They came up to me and said to me, uh, Pastor Bismarck, a month ago, we bought a brand new car. It was a Nissan. And uh, the Lord told us we are buying this car for somebody. Here are the keys for a brand new car. I was pretty stunned. They said, we don't have money to ship the car. If you'll ship it and so on, it's your car. And so I said, okay, just keep it until I can organize the shipping. So in those 21 days, with the preaching that I did and the offerings we received, I was able to raise the money for the shipping and ship that vehicle to Durban. Cheech and I took a bus with our kids to Durban to fetch a car. And so in my lifetime, I've received so many cars. I received more fuel than this building can hold, more clothes than all the wardrobes combined here can hold, shoes in mountains. And so what he's saying here is that God uses men to give to your bosom. I needed a car. Yes, somebody that the Lord told to buy a car. They didn't know who they were buying the car for. And so somebody has gold bars for someone here. They're just waiting for you to show. Someone has a suitcase full of good things in it. They know they've got to give it, Nestor, but they haven't met you yet. And they are faithful enough to keep it. Say, good measure. You guys are extremely, uh, uh, extremely tempered. Say, good measure. good measure. If you knew that you were about to get something significant, you'd say that with some power. Say, good measure. And so uh, I was sharing with the first service, generally Saturdays, I fuel up the cars. And generally, I'll put fuel in Pastor Gigi's car because you know she's not going to put fuel in her car. And so I drove up, and uh, the car was like two-thirds. I went with mine earlier. It was empty. It was like 110 to fill up my vehicle. And hers was two-thirds full, so I was just going to top it up. And so a guy came to me and says, oh, Bishop, it's good to see you. The Lord told me to fill up your tank. So I thought, well, why didn't you Lord tell you when I was coming with the first car? <laughs> because only like $23 to fill up the tank. And so God is going to fill you wherever you are, whether you're on empty, whether you're on three quarters. God has sent somebody to make sure that your house is full. I said, God has sent somebody. A widow woman has been prepared to make sure that your house is full. Oh, I feel this. Jesus' name. Job 1 verse 3. This is Job's financial statement. And it's quite significant the kinds of things that God blessed Job with. And how God blessed Job at the end of his life. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter number 6 and verse 11. During the years of Eli, Phineas, Hophni and Phineas, the ark of God was taken away. And so now the ark is being restored back to Israel after centuries. And so when they bring in the ark now from Abinadab's home, 
The scripture says that user touched the ark to stabilize it because it had hit a bump and it was about to fall. And the scripture says that the Lord killed user right there. And David got angry with God and said, I'm doing something here that is the right thing to do. Everyone gets the benefit of restoring the ark. We need your presence here. And now you've killed somebody and you've taken away the shine from a very glorious event. And the Lord said to him, go and study the scripture. The fact that user died and I was the one that caused him to die and killed him is not my fault. The blame is on you because you intended to do right. You were willing to do right. But your ignorance of the scripture has cost somebody their father, cost somebody their husband, cost nephews and nieces their uncle. So your ignorance of the scripture is not an excuse. You have to know and understand the scripture. God loves everybody, but if you are not prospering per chance, it's an area of the scripture that you have not observed to apply. You're saved, you're wonderfully washed in the blood, as faith was singing so melodiously, and some of you were like, oh, kumbaya, I'm washed in the blood, but you're going home in a combi, you're going home to no food, you don't know when last year you had a decent piece of meat, and it appears like God loves some people more than others. God loves people who observe the word, stands by the word, and he will back that word. And so in the words of, uh, of the prophet here, the prophet had told David, the breach has come because you have not observed to fulfill the whole scripture. And so they took the ark when this man was killed and put it in Obed-Dedim's house because he was a worshiper. And the scripture says, and the Lord blessed Obed-Dedim and all his household. One version said, the Lord blessed Obed-Dedim and filled his house. Shout, Lord, bless me and fill my house. Come on, shout, bless me and fill my house. Lord, bless New Life Covenant Church and fill this house. Fill every house, fill every church in Harare. Fill up every church. Fill up every church. Fill up every church. Tim and I went to Ibadan about three weeks ago, right? And uh, I think we're going to win the prize, Tammy, for the biggest noses. Because every second week we're getting our nose probed. We're going in a couple of weeks again. And they're just like digging up our nose and, you know. And uh, I told Dr. Joseph, you know, he's, he's changing my mind manually. <laughs> And so on our way to Ibadan, uh, I'd been to the Redeemed uh, Conference Ground a couple of times, but I'd never seen it in the day. And as we were driving down, I think Ibadan has about 5 million people, Lagos 25 to 30 million people. You can't really tell where one ends and the other one begins. But on the left, going towards Ibadan, you can see the Redeemed Campground and the, the main auditorium is three kilometers long. And it's also three kilometers deep. I was pointing it out to Tammy Tanashi, who went with me a few years ago. And on the left is Mountain of Fire Ministry. And they have equally a large campground. And they gather a million people at a time. And so I know when they built that uh, massive auditorium, uh, I think the platform may be two or three times the size of this building completely. And as high I think maybe in as high as the, as the balcony. And uh, that building cost 600 million, the frame, the steel, and the roof. And there were two individuals that were almost getting into a physical fight because they wanted to build it individually. And the general overseer came and calmed them down and separated them and said, okay, one can pay 300 million, the other can pay 300 million. And I've seen that building, I think I can say, maybe close to 2 million people. And so in this room, in this room right now, in this room right now, there's a couple of individuals where you will have the capacity to build Kingdom Cathedral. 20 million is nothing. <laughs> Professor Capepa, you'll do it. 
They'll say, 20 million is nothing. It's just like finia money. It's just like going to Bulawayo and paying two tolls. It's going to be nothing for you. It's in this room. God has promised to fill the house here this morning. God has promised to fill the house here this morning. Lawrence, I got a good feeling about what's coming in you and Pam's life. God's about to fill that. Fill that. I was looking at watches as he's my customer when I'm traveling. Just I love looking at watches. And uh, there was a watch, a Rolex watch I saw that I thought, oh man, if I had some money, I'd buy this. And uh, so uh, there was a man that walked in there and he ordered three watches. And there were 85,000, 100 and something thousand. He just took three watches and walked out. And I was just standing there shivering, shivering. And for him, it was like nothing. It's just like buying a hamburger. Now, if you're struggling to pay for a hamburger, maybe you shouldn't be at the Rolex counter. The Lord is promising individuals here that not only is he going to fill you with the power of his spirit, fill you with knowledge, fill you with love, happiness, and understanding, but he's going to fill you, your whole house, Obedidim, Bless your entire household. In a manner, there will not be enough room to receive it. And they told the king in verse 12, The Lord has blessed the house of Obedidim and everything that pertains to him. In other words, Obedidim's blessing is so full. He doesn't have enough feet for his shoes. He doesn't have enough fingers for his rings. His neck is not long enough for all of his ornaments and his necklaces, whatever. He doesn't have enough teeth for all the bling that he has. He doesn't have enough. It's all so filled. It's it's just totally filled. And just in a brief conversation with Brother Copeland in September, uh, on the sideline in the green room, uh, he was asking the guys, Chuda Bismarck, is he here? I know he's from Zimbabwe. I was sitting in the green room. And so they said he's here. And so I went and talked to him for a few minutes. And he said to me, he said, Brother Tudor, he said, the blessing I see on your life, you can't see it. But what I see on your life is so massive. And I'm saying, but I know that in my head. I'm saying, I know that. Will you please hurry up? Will you please hurry up? And so I understand that and I know that. But we could do with some expedition here. Expedite the expedition. Amen. God is about to expedite that. Somebody say amen. Amen. So there are ways in which you can fill your house. This house, church, your house as a family. Number one is give. Everyone say give. Africans are natural givers. Africans, we are givers until you ask. We are just natural givers. But when you ask, something happens with African people where it's like, how can they ask me for this? Huh? Look at the guy he's driving. How can he even ask me for this? And he keeps on talking about his trips. How can he ask me for this? So people are natural givers, Africans are, until you ask. Nigerians are great givers, phenomenal givers. Zimbabweans are good givers, good givers. And, and uh, I won't mention African countries that, ish, ish. Hey, we just bless them, Amen. So the first thing is you give, you sow seed. I was telling Primrose, every single day of my life, for the last number of years, I, am, I get a harvest every day. Joel, every day I receive money, every single day. And the reason for that, many years ago, I said, every single day I'm going to sow a seed. Every single day. And I still sow a seed. And every day, it comes to me. So if you have $10, break it up into seven $1 pieces and give a dollar a day. Give a dollar a day. Then as the months go by, Jackie, as the years go by, that harvest starts coming every day. Somebody from somewhere is looking for me to give me something. 
O ye of no faith. Marlon, I'm talking to you. Every single day. Almost every single day I find money. I never pass a coin on the floor. Never ever. A coin. I never leave it on the floor. On this last trip I picked up American cents. Maybe 12 cents as I was walking. I was about to step over one in there. But the Lord said to him, are you sure you're going to step over money I've put in your path? I picked it up and put it in my pocket. Every single day. Number two. Do not be afraid of debt. Do not be afraid of debt. Because you could miss a massive piece of land or a massive asset or come into a, uh, some sort of uh, a company opportunity that will require you to sign on the, on the dotted line to acquire significant capital for a housing complex. And, and so because you are afraid of debt, you are afraid that things are going to happen to you, you're not going to get yourself into trouble. Do not be afraid of debt. And there are preachers and faith preachers that teach that you shouldn't be in debt. But if you are going to build a $500 million uh, housing complex, where are you going to get $500 million from somebody uh, just to give you? And so do not be afraid of debt. Say that. Now, I'm not talking about borrowing money for a suit that you don't need. You can use the one you have or borrowing money to get a hamburger. I'm not talking about that kind of debt. I'm talking about an investment such as a building and building a tower. Number two, vision will make you full. Say, fill me with vision. Now talk to vision. Say, vision make us full. Say that three times. I'm amazed at the number of individuals who have been given opportunities but are expecting somebody else to give them. If you have a piece of ground this size, like this, that piece of ground can produce onions, it can produce garlic, it can produce some sort of greens, you can sell them on the side of the road, and doors open. Jogging in Rua, I'm seeing guys there selling diesel and fuel in, in uh, vinegar-sized bottles, half a liter. And I'm saying, Hah. the guy said to me, no. He said, uh, Bishop Jabula, he says, this is uh, uh, five bonds here. Please, come with your car. I need you to, to buy this from me. This is five bonds. Uh, this is, and he showed me another one, or two dollars or something like that. So I said, why don't you get a bigger container? He says, no, if I get a bigger container, people won't see what's in there. They'll think it's a scud. These here, I'm selling these here. Sometimes I sell 10 and 20 a day. He says, when I'm picking up plastic bottles, he says, it's to put fuel inside. I'm thinking, wow, at least the guy's doing something. And he said to me, my goal one day is to own my own filling station. I thought, wow, this is like mind-blowing. I had to jog in the middle of the day, in the middle of the sun, to learn a lesson like this. There's opportunity everywhere. There's opportunity everywhere. Say, make me full. Vision, make me full. Say that loud. One more time. God wants to fill your house with vision. He wants to fill your house with vision. Number two. Hard work with intent will fill your house. Hard work with intent will fill your house. There's somebody that's become a friend. When he was a boy, his father was digging ditches. Digging ditches for the council in Lagos. And he vowed, he said, the only ditch I'll ever dig is going to be a ditch that carries fuel. And today he's one of the wealthiest guys in West Africa. And he's built a pipeline. 
And he's built a guest line from Ghana, through Togo, through Benin, into Lagos. And he's happy digging ditches. God is about to fill you with hard work that is meaningful. If you are going to be carrying things, make sure it's trucks. Carrying goods and charging thousands of dollars. If you are going to be washing things, make sure it's going to be washing entire buildings. My brother worked for a cleaning company. And they would work at night in Joburg. When everybody had gone off, they'd be coming in with their vacuum cleaners and cleaning. And he was like an under... He was, his supervisor was a, a, a friend of my mom and dad's. He was working as a middleman. And there was a young uh, black lady from Soweto. She was right at the bottom of the food chain. And she used to tell him, she said, you know, one day, Mark, I'm going to own a cleaning business and everybody around you is going to be working. And they used to laugh at her. Today, that lady is the third wealthiest cleaning person in, in, South, in, in Johannesburg. She worked herself from there. Because in the middle of the night, she was learning all the things, how to supply, where to buy, who to employ, how to employ, learning how to do wages. And Mark was telling me that a certain guest had come from the States and, and she gave Mark to use the Phantom to pick up this guest, one of her many cars. And so what God is going to do, he's going to fill you up with hard work, with an intention that it pays you. You can't be digging and working all night and all day and there's nothing coming back for you. God's going to fill you with hard work, with intent. God is going to fill you to understand the laws of plenty and abundance. You are going to understand the laws of plenty and abundance. You are going to understand the laws of plenty and abundance. You are going to understand the laws of plenty and abundance. How one loaf will have so much that 12 baskets will be in an overflow. Put in your mind, in your head, in your desire for God to give you his spirit of plenty and abundance. God is so generous. God is so generous. If you just look at seed, the other day I saw on one of the news channels, I think it was in India, the doctors welcomed the seventh billionth human being in the earth. I don't know if you saw that report. A little baby was born. She was number seven billion and welcomed her into the world. And the doctors said, in essence, we welcome you into a world. It may not be a pleasant world. It's a difficult world in India but number seven billion welcome into the world. But that young lady that was born into the world, she was one of billions of sperm trying to find their way because God is so generous. Only one makes the hit. There are several billion that don't. Why didn't God only release one seed? God is so generous. He puts billions in all. If you look at the way God flowers the earth and puts grass in the earth, if you look at the way God stocked the seas, God is so generous. And I'm praying that God will fill you with his intent of abundance, with a harvest that's way beyond your craziest thought, with with an abundance that will blow your mind, that he will fill your house, this one here, fill your house with health, with strength, with energy. That the older you get, the younger you become. Amen. The harder you work, the less effort you apply. The more energy required, the more energy you will garner and retain. I'm praying that God would bless every person here listening with abundance, with plenty, and that he will fill your house. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let's go now to Luke chapter number 12 and verse 43. Luke 12 and verse 43 as we come to our our close. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, that's every one of us, when you're born again, the unclean spirit leaves you. He walks through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, 
I will return to my house. Can you imagine? You as an individual, that unclean spirit is claiming you as his house. I'm telling every unclean spirit, you don't own this house. I own this house. Say, I own this house. Come on, say, I own this house. You, you may have been born again, in my case, 52 years ago. There could be a spirit roaming the earth in dry places, claiming this as his house. And may come back on my 65th birthday and say, ah, my house is clean. This house is clean. I'm going to go and get all kinds of things to fill it up. But in the 52 years, I've made sure that I filled my house. Turn to your neighbor and say, fill up your house. Say, fill up your house. Fill up your house with number one, wisdom. I said, fill up your house with understanding. Fill up your house with knowledge. Fill up your house with kindness. Fill up your house with happiness, peace, and joy. Say, my house is full. Say, my house is full. Go back to school and fill up your house with knowledge. Get another degree. Fill up your house with relationships. Make friends in the way. Luke chapter 16. Make friends in the marketplace. Make friends in the fuel industry. Make friends in the grocery and retail industry. Make friends in the clothing and shoe industry. You don't have to have hair to make friends with somebody in the hair industry. You got to make friends everywhere. So that if a famine ever comes, you've got friends that can bail you out in a time of trouble. Don't allow any spirit or demon to come from a dry place and claim your house as its house. Shout devil. My house is filled with good things. Brothers and sisters, sweep out the dirt. Get out the envy and the jealousy. Get out the malice and the hate. Don't be jealous of someone with an expensive watch. Just make money and buy your own. Don't be envious of somebody with an elaborate car. Just buy your own three. Somebody got to shout amen. The devil comes back and says, I'm bringing seven devils more vile. Just remember that when you kick the devil out and you started filling your house, your house began to grow seven times greater and seven times bigger, seven times longer and wider, seven times higher, that you are so powerful now that by yourself, a devil that kept you captive all your years before you became born again has to get seven devils more powerful than you are. Sisters and brothers, God has expanded and enlarged your territory where seven more devils only have the power to overcome you. Take good cheer in this that God has already filled your house with good things. Shout, I'm not empty. Shout, I'm not an empty vessel. Shout, I'm full of good things. Shout, I'm full of powerful things. Shout, I'm full of wealth and strength. Shout, I'm full, overflowing to the brim. Shout, my best years are starting right now. My best steps are organized right now. My best offerings are organized right now. My best praise is being offered now. My best worship is coming out of me now. Oh yes, my best vision. My best vision is about to appear now. In Exodus 3:21. I'm coming out of a bad place into a good space. I'm coming out of tyranny into freedom. I'm coming out of bondage into total elation for what God can do. But I've made up my mind. I'm not coming out empty. Shout, I'm not coming out empty.
Shout, I'm not coming out empty. For these 400 years plus, what the devil has stripped from my family, God is filling my house. God is filling my house. Shout, God is filling my house. He's filling my house. Shout, Lord, fill my house. Shout, Lord, fill my house. I said, shout, Lord, fill my house. Clap your hands for a full house. Come on, Tammy. Chi Chi and I were in Houston and we went to a health store buying some food there and we saw mulberries going for like $24 for a handful and I'm saying they're growing wild in Zimbabwe these cream of tartar things that you find on a baobab tree were going for $15, $16 for a teaspoonful and it's growing wild in Zimbabwe hibiscus flower pollen that we see growing everywhere is going for so much money and I'm saying Lord you have filled our house in Zimbabwe with good things but people still want to leave here when your house is full shout Lord open my eyes to see good things in my life good things around me come on clap your hands for the blessing of the Lord that's all around you Stand with me as we pray. I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter number six. What slide is that? Slide 16. And it shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought you into the land which he swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you great and goodly cities which you did not build. Say great and goodly cities. Say great and goodly cities. Say great and goodly cities. Though when I landed in Dubai, going to the States last week, uh, for the first time in a long time, they didn't park us by the jet bridge where you walk off. They parked us on the other side where we had to take a bus. And I cried all the way on the bus. You know, they have a bus for first class, then business class and economy class. So there were three of us sitting in the first class bus. And I was crying and crying. And the one man said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm fine. And the reason I was crying... The one terminal, just the one terminal, and there's three. The one terminal is three kilometers long. Three. And so God just want, doesn't want to give you a city. If he's going to give me a city, please don't give me Lagos. No, I mean, there's things that have to be fixed there, too many. Give me Dubai. Lagos is a great city. One of the greatest cities I've ever been in my life. When we're talking about goodly, there's too much work to be done. If you're going to give me a great city, give me Dubai. Give, Give me Singapore. Give me Houston. Don't give me Maputo. the scripture 
He said he's going to give you great and goodly cities. Of course, you didn't build them. But look at verse 11. And houses. What? Full of all good things which you didn't fill. Because a house can be full of cockroaches, full of rats, mice, dirt. A friend of mine got a building for a church, a lovely building. The chairs were there, but it cost him so much money. Just the chairs, the dust, the dirt, the rat poo, the rat wee. It was just, it was gross, gross, gross. God is giving you Simba a house full. Put that scripture again. And houses. Say houses. Say houses. Say that again. What's the next word? Houses. Of what? Seeing a full house. Seeing a full house. Father, send believers. Send good men for single women. Send good women for single men. Let 2022 be a year of marriages and births and blessing and compensation full of good things which we didn't fill. Give us things that we'll never be able to wear. Food that we'll never be able to eat. Give me tickets to fly on the same day with three airlines as an option that I'll choose. Give me more glasses than Elton John. Father, we thank you for your blessing.